Tonight I'm going to talk about a chapter from a new book I'm writing called The Design of Race, How Visual Culture Shaped America, which I'm very excited about. So the chapter I'm going to talk about is called Afterlife, Vestiges in Word and Image. Um, and it's all about African-American artists, including Kara Walker, who um, I was already writing about and thinking about, so this is very fortuitous for me. Uh, also, I have a class right now called Visualizing Race, which is a hum um, honors course, and very interesting course, but this is the first time I've taught it with undergrads, so I've always taught it with graduate students. Um, the students take a DNA test that determines their racial admixture, sometimes with surprises. Um, we also are gonna re, um, create a virtual exhibition of an ex exhibition I did uh, six years ago with my brother called American Race. So watch for that, it'll be over at the cave, which is an SER. So in this chapter, I look at the links between text and image and contemporary art as central to the work of several important contemporary African-American artists and their reappropriation, revalorization, and interrogation of texts and racialized images, whose meanings they often subvert or invert. I will con consider closely their consistent use of the language and forms of graphic design, especially through the use and the reworking of lettering, letter forms, and typography as signifiers of artistic agency through mark making. In addition, I consider the intertextuality of words and images as an expression of the play between identity and stereotype in relation to double consciousness as well as other racialized visual experiences. This hinges on an acknowledgement of the several ways that the technologies of the art of mechanical reproduction have fundamentally formed the image of the African American, utilized as commodity and vessel of an othered antithetical US national identity. I analyze the response to this dynamic by artists reasserting black identity over blackness as spectacle and against the grain of white supremacy as not simply an expression of racism, but the very material of it formed through words and images. By considering these artifacts in part as design reveals the important interplay between commerce, technology, design, art, materiality, and identity. This consideration of visual culture as the materially reproduced reveals these as well as a wide variety of other actors who exert agency over this production, but have enacted it through and upon others whose own agency has been denied. These artists resist this, this denial by reasserting their presence within the same visual landscape in which they have been silenced, absented, and removed. They write and rewrite upon images and often in tandem with bodies. Crucial to the work produced by these artists are bodies themselves, as you can see, especially as observed and evidenced in the works considered here and within the context of US visual culture and racialized representation. Many of the works deal with flattened planes, figures of absence, erasures and collapses that directly confront the pure formalism of modernism. This is seen in Glenn Ligon's stencils, Kara Walker's silhouettes, Lorna Simpson's divided, turned, and headless poses, and Hank Willis Thomas, Michael Ray Charles, and Carrie Mae Weems' embrace of the vernacular of advertising. And of course, K.R. James Marshall's very deeply saturated black figures. These artists rely on vernacular forms or the seemingly naive application of graphic forms that draw back to the early formative and commodity driven roots of US visual culture of graphic design. They then revisualize many of the forms associated with the, this period and its direct impact and legacy on their own lived experience. These works question art as commodity, um, as value abstracted, just as they also question the images and the bodies of others who are pictured and therefore abstracted, who labor to serve and to be exchanged. The presence of text within and upon these works makes clear that they are designed to be read. The words in the text may at times either confirm or deny the visual stereotypes and tropes presented or confront their flaws by revealing the deep gaps between them. In situating their work in the context of contemporary art, these artists displaced the designed and domesticated racialized subject from its familial context and extricate its value as commodity. This is mirrored by the imagery of commodity forms in the exchange of commercial goods dating to Reconstruction and Jim Crow and the nascent consumer economy of the US that pictured racialized subject, subjects as exchangeable. The consistent coupling of text and image the commingling of the verbal and the visual and the work of these artists brings into relief the hybridity of African-American life beginning in and through the standardization of US visual culture, reproduced not for African-Americans, but to assert white supremacy. 
These artists draw upon the material experience of words and the effects of rereading re these in direct opposition to racialized imagery as a means to confront racism. The materiality of these works is central to my argument and the consideration of their place as design artifacts in their mediation of the verbal and visual and their exchange of images of blackness as consumables. Unique to my argument is its demand that graphic design as a process of education and a creative field recognize the central role of race in defining how representations are produced, not simply as they function um, as a product. The, this distinction may seem minor, but not if we consider how racialized representations are largely ignored in graphic design education and criticism, which itself is quite limited within the US when this is compared with other fields associated with media and mediation. Furthermore, there is no better field to be studied, field of study to be studied for its impact on the reproduction of representations, considering the immense output and ephemerality of graphic design production and consumption. Taking it further, no other field of study is equally concerned with and directly utilizes the verbal and the visual, and none that typically marries these two in a seamless integration of what are generally accepted as opposing forms residing in different spheres. It is this lack of bifurcation in graphic design, its direct engagement with both and their reproduction that a graphic design perspective brings to this consideration of contemporary artists coming to terms with racialized images and words as African Americans who are themselves visualized as other. Uh, this is why I wish to examine these works, if not as images, always directly referencing specific graphic designer effects than as designed objects operating in the exchange of ideas and as exchangeable. Initially, I saw Kara Walker's work in this project as the exception among these artists, rarely employing text to counter or complement imagery. imagery sorry. I was most familiar with her silhouettes and not her larger body of work, especially her drawings. Uh, when incorporating text, she does typically hand letter in the same manner as her, drawing, her drawings, integrating it in the same medium. She writes briefly and tersely or alternately verbosely and very floridly, which mimics the line work in her drawings. Occasionally, she will obliquely reference an existing letter form or typeface. Like Carrie Mae Weems, she employs and interrogates the instruments of art and science and the ways these have defined the very act of looking as a form of white supremacy. In looking, the eye becomes the lens and a prosthesis of the gaze, and the other, the scene, that which is captured through looking. Walker uses the silhouette to aid the viewer in understanding the links between art and technology, stretching from the Enlightenment into the antebellum South, where the silhouette was a popular form for creating a likeness. Meanwhile, photography was slowly emerging, seeking a form that could fix an image. The silhouette, like all likenesses, is inaccurate, and but a projection captured in fine line detail. Walker plays with the notion of the likeness in this period, when most often no effort was made to accurately capture the image of the African American. Her silhouettes have many things in common with the reductive forms of the graphic arts, but without typically drawing on the commodified images of African Americans seen in the popular press and entertainments of the 19th century. This is doubtless because she focuses on antebellum imagery of the enslaved and of the slaveholder. Her chief aim is a rejection of a sentimentalized, sentimentalized image of the Old South and the plantation life as an ideal, as an ideal. The figures she creates in line and flat planes are images of the secret life of slavery, rather than the fictionalized and popular notions of the domesticated spaces of slavery. She directly counters the supposedly familial aspects of slave life and the violence it required, as well as the traumatizing effects of miscegenation. Her figures, though flat and reductive, are not themselves objectifications, as Carrie stated, but players that pretend to be contained in the viewer's gaze in the fiction that the observable will produce, if not the truth, then a very near likeness. Walker's hand produces lines that are highly active, threaded together, overlapping and dense. And when she cuts her silhouette, she literally draws the eye to the edges in a sharp detail similar to photography's conceit as the pencil of nature. In her use of the cyclorama, her figures rendered in black paper and affixed to walls remain unframed as the viewer turns to unwrap the scene. The actions of the figures on the white walls with their bodies overlapping reinforces the interplay of the positive and negative shapes in the, in, that are produced by the variegated lines of the figures and other shapes they form. Though most of her figures are cut in black paper to represent blackness, she does cut figures in black of white slaveholders and catchers. 
She accomplishes what few have ever done effectively. She makes whiteness strange. She pictures whites with pinched and pointed noses, flattened rear ends, bloated bellies, sloping foreheads, jutting jaws, limp and distended phalluses, and beady eyes. She employs the physiognomous gimlet eye to see whiteness as other. In her world, the slavers do not escape her view, and it is the fine-toothed detail, the silhouette, that produces and reveals the flaws in the bodies of white perpetrators of violence. She creates a spectacle of the grotesque that equates the common and deliberately dysmorphic presentation of black bodies along with white bodies, and the disgust associated with bodily fluids and excretions and their corollary with miscegenation. She creates and explicitly names her work as allegories to describe the nature of race in America as a living record of images, objects, words, and bodies strewn over time. An origin story of the creation of the myth of race in America as polarized, one that hides but never fully obscures the actual genesis of the American. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.